have a seat and welcome to Renovation Church. If this is your first time, I'm Pastor Dustin, and uh, it's it's a good day. We have uh, Santiago with us, and he's gonna he's gonna share some some truth with you here in just a minute that that is important. I want to share something real quick with you because I was thinking about this last night about about our brother coming today and, and sharing this with us. The fact that uh, if we call ourselves believers, if we truly believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we can't sit by and do nothing. And so you're going to hear some truth today, and I want you to let it soak in. And I'll tell you, at the end, we're going to have some baskets back there because the tithe boxes are always where they're at, obviously. But there will be some baskets also for uh, just a love offering to our brother and his, and his family as they go and do some ministry. He's going to tell you about that here in a second. But it is, it is super important what he's doing. He's going into a place that, that does not want him there. But he's going to go anyway because he's supposed to. And it's not free to go there. It's not free to travel. We know that. And it's not free to stay places. It's not free to make materials to share the truth of Jesus. It'd be great if it was, but it's, it's the church that's supposed to come together and help each other in these ministries. So, brother, why don't you come on up here, and uh, I'll let you have the floor and and then share, share what God's laid on your heart with them today. I'm glad you're here. Well, God bless everybody this morning. I sure appreciate Pastor having me here. Uh, I am a U.S. missionary, and uh, we do work uh, among the major Christian cults here in the U.S., mainly the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, groups of that nature. How many have been visited by a Jehovah's Witness before, or a Mormon? Most of you have. I knew that there would be probably many hands that will pick up. Every time I, I, I speak at church, I, I ask the same question, how many... And most people will raise their hands. You know, that, that speaks to the effectiveness of these groups. How, how, how devoted, how dedicated they are. You know, I could ask the same question if I'm at a church in China or if I'm at a church in Europe or Latin America. And most people will raise their hands. That they have been visited by these groups. So these groups are very effective. They're, they're growing tremendously here in the U.S. The Mormons are the fastest growing church in the U.S. right now. The Jehovah Witnesses are the third fastest growing church in the U.S. right now. So these groups are, are growing all over the world, but here in the U.S., this is their major growth. Uh, I am a former Jehovah Witness myself. I used to be Jehovah Witness most of my life. Uh, I worked for their headquarters in Brooklyn, and I was an editor for a magazine called The Watchtower. This is a, uh, a monthly magazine that they produce. I, I edited that magazine for eight years until back in 95 became a Christian. But, uh, yeah, these groups are, are growing tremendously here in the U.S. And, you know, uh, when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I knocked on a lot of doors. You know, you can imagine I was full-time uh, with Jehovah's Witness. And, you know, your, your very common scenario when you stand at the door and you knock. And sometimes you can see people with, inside the houses through the blinds, through the windows, and... Most people kind of look at each other like, who's that? And all of a sudden, they're like, they figure it out, and they're like, shh. Hi. Yeah. I'm sure you guys have done that as well. But, but, you know, very rarely does a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon get challenged at the door by a Christian. Very rare. That doesn't happen very often. It's usually the other way around. It's usually the Mormon, the Jehovah Witness, that's challenging the Christian. And a lot of times the Christian doesn't know what they believe. Much less what a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness would believe. So that, that is a big problem because we're supposed to be able to share our faith. Right? That we're commanded to share our faith with the lost. And these people are lost. And so it's opportunity that God gives us. You know, I, I tell people, you never know. Maybe God's sending them to your door. So, you could, so they can have a presentation of the gospel from you. So it, it's, it's very difficult for a Jehovah Witness Mormon sometimes to come to Christ, to come to a true faith, because the people who are supposed to do it are not doing it. So that's kind of where, where 
on my mission when I, it, back in 2001, we started doing this work and I figured, what's the best way that I could help is equipping local churches on what these groups believe and how to reach out to them. I do debates, I do about five or six debates a year with Mormon apologists, Jehovah and representatives in universities. Uh, I have Bible studies going on every week with Mormons, families, Jehovah Witness families, trying to reach out to them. But that's kind of, as a missionary, that's kind of the work that we do. You know, there's, I meet with, missionary, with Mormons all the time, Jehovah Witness all the time, and you know, these groups are growing tremendously here in the U.S. Mormons, they're, they're pushing close to 20 million members in the world. You know, here in the U.S., there's close to 12 million Mormons here in the U.S., so that's, that's quite a bit of, of, of people. Jehovah Witnesses, you know, Jehovah Witnesses have over 14 million in the world. They're pushing 9 million here in the U.S. So these groups are growing. Both of these groups have extensive missionary program. That's their major thrust. That's their major work is missionaries that go to your door. And most of you raise your hand that you've been visited by these groups. So these, this is their major. Mormons have 90,000 90, missionaries. You know, 90,000 full-time appointed missionaries. Jehovah Witnesses are a little different. Jehovah Witnesses believe that every Jehovah Witness is a missionary. Every Jehovah Witness is a minister of the gospel. So you're talking about millions of them going door to door every week. So much that they have to construct 50 churches a week, 50 kingdom halls, 50 Jehovah Witness churches a week they construct in the world. So a lot of, a lot of churches, a lot of Jehovah Witnesses, a lot of Mormons in the world. And so this is kind of where we're at. And we are supposed to share our faith with these groups. A lot of times these groups come to your door. They, they, they might share some, some things. And, uh, but, you know, tonight at the uh, question and answer ses session tonight, I would go into more detail on these groups. So like a pastor said, if you have a question, write it down. I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, here, uh, I think it was five years ago, six years ago, a little bit before COVID, I started recording some CDs for Mormons. And these CDs that I record for Mormons is just kind of five-minute message that I record for a Mormon in a way that a Mormon can understand. And I'd never done this before, but I thought, I'm going to take a whole bunch of them, record a whole bunch of CDs, and take them to the Mormon General Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah. Never been to a Mormon General Conference before. So I recorded 5,000 CDs, and I thought, man, sure, these should be enough. So I went to Salt Lake. And when I got there to the Mormon General Conference, I thought, what did I do? I brought, I didn't bring enough. There was like, I didn't know this. There was three sessions a day, and there was 27,000 at each session. And here I am with just 5,000 CDs, and it's a week long. I started handing out CDs, and they were just, people were just grabbing them, and it wasn't even noon yet that first day I ran out of CDs. But I did put my phone number on the CDs, and I thought, well, maybe... I'll just hang out the next few days and meet and sh share with them. And Well, I kept getting phone calls from Mormons who had got the CD. They would say, are you still here at the conference? We'd like to meet with you. We, we listen to the CD. We have some questions. Well, I had to stay an additional week, and I met with like 50 families who had got a CD. And out of those 50 families, I stayed, uh, I stayed a couple of days later, 15 of them came to Christ. 15 families came to Christ with all the CDs. So the year after, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little more CDs. And uh, I did maybe about 7,000. And these 15 families who gave their life to Christ, the Mormons, they were there with me the next year, handing out CDs. And so we've been doing that every year after. Then COVID hit, and then it kind of, and then so we're, we're going back in, in June to, to do the same thing. But I'm going to have like 24 of the ex-Mormons who, who had gotten saved through the CD helping me distribute the CD. So I, I'm kind of between a rock and a hard place because I need a lot of CDs. It, they were costing me about $2.50 to make each one. But now I got it down and I, I could make one for $0.67 cents a piece, which is pretty cheap. But I need a lot of them. I need a lot of them. And, and I have like enough for like 1200 right now. But I need, I need a lot more. So uh, 
as pastor said, if you'd like to help, let, let me know. Let the pastor know because I, I, I'm leaving here very quick and I, uh, I'm trying to get as much as I can. So I need help with that. But if you have your Bible, I'd like to share. You know, tonight I'll be talking more detail on these groups, but I'd like to share some scripture with you in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. As I got this date for, with a pastor to come and speak here, I, I've been thinking since then what, what to talk about, what to, what to say. And these, these verses have just kind of been in my mind quite a bit. And I want to, they, they, they speak to, to everything that I've been doing, everything that as a church we should do. But here in verse 18 through verse 21, Jesus says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. So Jesus is communicating to his disciples and telling them that they are going to hate them. He's telling his apostles they're going to persecute you. They're, you're not going to be liked. You're going to be persecuted because of the truth. And Jesus said, if they hate me, they will hate you. And we know they hated our Lord and Master. I mean, to me, that's an amazing thing, that God himself came to earth. You would think people would love him, right? You would think he would be loved by all. After all, you know, where do you see a human king in our human history that goes out and takes off his crown, takes off his robe, steps out of his throne and go and help a people somewhere? You don't find human kings do that. Look at our human history. But you, you find this great king of scripture, this great God who came to earth, born in a manger, not even known by who he was by most of the people. There he was working in Joseph carpenter shop and then goes to a cross, withhold his hand and dies for me and for you. We have a great God, don't we? that died for us. But he was hated. And he, Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. You know, this is a primary mark of the true church on earth, that the church has always been hated and despised by the world. This has been always the case. If you looked at the early church, the church fathers, all, all these different, they all were hated and despised. The church has always been like that, except today. Except today. No longer is a world hate the church because I think the church has become a friend to the world and we, we make excuses we want to win the world so we'll be part of the world to win the world well I think it's the other way around but this is kind of a primary mark you know I've been studying on some of the reformation some of the, the reformers and you know during the reformation era there was a lot of people who were burned at the stake, who were martyred because of this truth. I remember reading about Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, who were prelates of the Church of England. They were bound back to back on the same stake, and as the fires come up, Hugh Latimer's last words was, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall light such a candle by God's grace, as I trust shall never be put out. But I wonder if the candle is out. Is it barely flickering in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I believe that we should have the same spirit as these reformers. I think it was Oswald, Oswald Chambers, who was a Christian author, who said, in your, zeal to be, in your zeal to get people to accept the gospel, be careful you don't manufacture the gospel to make it acceptable to the people. And I think as a church, this is where we're at. I'm not talking about this specific church. I'm talking about the church in general. You know, we're, we're losing a lot of people to cults. You know, a lot of people to these groups. And 
You know, during the Reformation era, they had certain truths that they died for, certain truths that they believed, that they fought for, that I think today as a church, we should fight for these doctrines. And all I want to do is talk about one or two or three of them. But they used to be called solas in Latin. Solas mean only. And one of their main doctrines that they fought for was sola scriptura, or the Bible only, scripture alone. How many believe that? That we are saved, that we know Jesus Christ, that we can grow in Christ by the scriptures alone. You know, every major cult would deny this doctrine. Every major cult would deny that we are saved by faith in Christ alone. You know, they, they, they all say they're, that they don't. If you're a Jehovah Witness, for example, Jehovah Witness will say that you're not saved by faith alone, but it's faith coupled by works and membership in our church. If you're a Jehovah Witness, you cannot celebrate birthdays, holidays, cannot vote, cannot salute the flag. Uh, you got to do door-to-door -door, uh, witnessing. They have certain hours required. You, you got to do it every, every, every month. Uh, all these different things you got to do to be right with God. But even if you do these things, you cannot really know whether you're right or not. You just have to hope that you're doing enough. Mormons believe the same type of thing. Mormons believe that salvation starts at baptism and then it has different endowments, different things you got to do uh, to be saved. But even if you've been a Mormon for, for quite a while, you still don't know whether you are saved or not. But the Bible says that we can know, right? That we can know that we're saved because it's, it's not from ourselves. If it was because of what we can do, then yes, I would join their ranks and say, well, we, 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 we don't know because it depends on what I do. But it, because, it depends on what Christ did for us. And that's what salvation is, is, is all about. But that's what they believe that you, you, you must, you know, you must, they say you must do these things in order to, to, to be in the right path, in order for you to, to truly be saved. You must do these different things. You know, when you're a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon, you got to do a lot of things. You got to do all these different things that I, I mentioned. But the main thing, you cannot know whether you're really saved or not. It's a process to them. You know, they give you salvation in installments. They don't give you the whole thing right away. You have to keep coming back, keep coming back. So, so they just give it, give it to you in certain, certain uh, times. And yet the Bible say that we supply nothing. We supply nothing but the sinner to be saved. You know, that's what the Bible, we supply nothing. But, you know, the, these, this group says they really believe that. I was debating with a Mormon apologist uh, maybe about eight months ago, and we were talking, and I asked him, how long have you been a Mormon? And he said, man, I, I've been a Mormon 50 years. I said, wow, you've been a Mormon most of your life. He said, yep, not only that, but I give my finances, I give my heart, my family, everything to our church. I said, wow, you're a very dedicated Mormon. He said, yes, I am. I said, would you consider yourself then saved, born again? Have you passed from death to life like the Bible says? And he says, no, no, no. No one can know whether they're saved. No one can know. And I said, well, what is salvation then in your church? And he said, salvation is like a ladder. You start at the bottom and you go every rung until you get to the top. I said, do you at least know where you're at, at that ladder? Are you halfway there? He said, no one can know. You know, what a pitiful view of heaven, of salvation, of redemption, atonement, that you cannot know. You know, that's just amazing. You, you cannot know. And the Bible says, taste and see that God is good. The Bible says that we are saved by faith. Not by works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It is by grace you have been saved. Notice the Bible says you have been saved in the past tense. 
This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God so no one can boast. So it is a gift of God. They don't understand this. They don't understand that salvation is a gift. They have to work at it. They view salvation as a reward. But nowhere in Scripture does it say salvation is a reward. It always is a gift. It always comes from above. It is something that God places upon you. And he told me, well, you know, I'm just trying to be righteous. I'm trying to, God's going to make me righteous. He's making me righteous. And I'm trying to make, be righteous. And he said, I, I've been struggling with this for a while. And I, I, said, well, I said, look, you've been enjoying this for 50 years. Or a Mormon for 50 years. And you've been trying to be righteous for 50 years. Have you attained it? Are you even close to it? He says, I, I don't know. I said, I think I, could, I think I could solve this issue here. I said, because the Bible doesn't say that he will make you righteous. The Bible says he declares you righteous. He declares a person righteous. I said, if God were to tell you, I declare you righteous. I, I put the righteousness of my son upon you. Wouldn't you say you, you're saved? You know, isn't that a great gift that he could declare us righteous? If that's the case, it doesn't depend upon ourselves. It solely depends on Christ alone. His finish worked on the cross. This would have bring salvation to us. And this is what Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't understand. They believe that it's, 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 a, it's a work. You know, I think Martin Luther, the great reformer, was correct. He said, I dread, he, he actually said, a, a, a rich, rich, wretched, poor, and helpless worm on thy kind arms I fall. It is a faith in Christ alone they were saved. You know, the Bible says we can't even trust ourselves, right? Cannot trust yourselves. You can't trust the church. You can't trust yourselves. You can't trust a denomination. Then what can we trust? Jesus Christ alone. That's what we should have our full trust in Christ alone. And that's, this is what these groups cults would, would, would deny completely that it's by faith alone. They also deny that the Bible speaks to you alone. You know, they, the reformers call it sola scriptura. The scriptures alone. This is, this is what they call it. And every major cult deny that the Bible is our only rule of faith. Some cults will say that the Bible is, is infallible. Mormons will not, but Jehovah's Witness will. But both groups will say that it's not sufficient for you. So you have the Bible, but you have other books of authority. You know, Mormons have four books they view as Bible or authority. Mormons have one book called the Book of Mormon. They have the Bible. They have another book called Doctrine and Covenants. And they have a fourth book called the Pearl, a Great Price. So you have the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and a Protegree Price. Out of these four books, if you use scripture, which one do you think is the least authoritative to a Mormon? The Bible. The Bible is the least book read. The Bible, they say, you can't fully trust it. You know, when Joseph Smith translated the, the, uh, the Book of Mormon to the English language, he didn't write the Book of Mormon. He only translated it, supposedly. But he did write the introduction to the Book of Mormon. And in their introduction, he said this. He said, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct book on earth and the keystone of our religion, and that a man will get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts and by any other book. So wait, it's, a, it's the most correct book on earth. It is the keystone of our religion, and a man will get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts and by any other book. So if you were a Mormon, which book would you read the most? The Book of Mormon, why? Because it's the most correct book on earth. It is a keystone. It will bring you closer to God than by any other book on earth. Ezra Taft Benson, who, who was their former president or prophet of their church, said there will be 10,000 times people over more people saved because of the Book of Mormon than there will be because of the Bible. So they put a lot of trust and hinge everything on this Book of Mormon. Yet I was debating this Mormon apologist, the same one that I was talking to you earlier about, 
And I asked him, I said, how do you know that the Book of Mormon comes from God? Now, isn't that a good question to ask a Mormon? How do you know that the Book of Mormon comes from God? Do you have any external evidence, internal evidence, any archaeological evidence? How do you know that the Book of Mormon comes from God? He said, we don't have any physical evidence. We have an internal evidence. And, and Mormon missionaries will try to tell you this when they come to your door. Oh, we want you to pray over the Book of Mormon. You pray over it, you read it, and you'll feel this burning in your bosom. And this is how you know that, that it comes from God. Just a feeling. Just pray about it. Is that the way they, the early church found out what was truth? Just pray about it. You know what? Prayer should never be a test for religious truth. It should never be prayer. It should be the scriptures. We, Paul said to test all things and hold to what is good. Now, how do you know what is right, what is wrong? You know, there's a lot of people out there saying a lot of things. And how do we know what is truth? Just because we feel good about it? This Mormon told me, hey, pray about it tonight. Pray about it and, and read it and pray about it. And you'll feel this burning in your bosom. I don't know. What if I, my wife could make some pretty good Mexican food? If she makes make some Mexican food and I eat it that night and I'm reading the Book of Mormon, I'll have a burning in my bosom. It's not because of the, <laughs> might be the spices. But it's, it's not a feeling, it's, it, it has to be the scriptures. We must go and test things. You know, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, How from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. Oh, wait a minute. They're able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God, useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God might be dedicated, capable of equipping, being equipped for every good work. So it is the scriptures that makes you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So it is the scriptures alone. In, in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12, it says that as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. The Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said is true. Imagine that. They were testing Paul with the scripture that they had at the time. They didn't say, hey, let me pray about it. No, they searched the scriptures. And Paul didn't, didn't get upset at them. He commended them. He said they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures to see whether these things are so. I, I think that's, that's the issue is, you know, if a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness will read the Bible only, they will never come to their conclusions. They will never come to these doctrines that they, that has to be taught to them through an outside source, through a Watchtower magazine, through, through a Book of Mormon, a Doctrine and Covenants, uh, through their hierarchy, through their church uh, groups, you know, their, their, their leaders. But what if you read the Bible only? You know, I, I've asked a Jehovah Witness for a Mormon, I said, what if I'm stranded somewhere in an island? And I'm shipwrecked. And I barely get to an island. There's no, no, no body in the island. There's no, no people there. And I'm just there. And I only have in my pocket a little pocket Bible. Could God speak to me then? They say, no, he can't. You need our church. They say, our church is a ministry of redemption. They say, God speaks to us through the columns of the Watchtower magazine. God, that's how God speaks to you. They say, God speaks to you. God doesn't speak to you. He speaks to seven men that are the, the, the uh, hierarchy of Jehovah's Witnesses, their governing body is called. Then from, their, from them, their, it goes into the printing presses and comes out in the form of a magazine called the Watchtower. Then they're boxed and shipped to all the kingdom halls all over the world, Jehovah's Witness churches, finally falls into the hand of the Jehovah's Witness and then come to your door. They come knocking. That's how God speaks to you. Not, not through... 
any, any other way. God speaks to you that way, and that's, that's what they say. But is that, is that true? I'll actually give you a couple of quotes here from their Watchtower magazine. Uh, as, 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 as far as being saved, they say this in their July 1st, 1947 Watchtower. To get one's name written in the book of life would depend upon one's work. You know, can you imagine having that burden upon you? You know, it depends upon one's work. That's, that's what they believe. Mormons, Mormons to say things a little the same way, but a little different. Mormons say this, individual salvation or the rescue from the effects of personal sins is to be acquired by each for himself. By faith and good works, redemption for personal sins can only be obtained through obedience to the requirements of the gospel and a life of good works. A life of good works. Imagine that. We are saved not by faith, alone they say by life of good works so these reformers they believed that it was scripture alone they believed that it was faith alone they also believed it was a cross alone the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ you know Jesus says in nine, Luke 9 23 Jesus said to them if anyone will come after me he must deny himself take up the cross and follow me how many believe that we are to follow Christ? After we're a Christian, we're supposed to follow him. You know, true Christianity centers upon this cross. You know, A.W. A. Tozer said this. He said, we must do something about the cross. One of two things we can do. We could flee from it or we could die upon it. That's, all, that's it. We could flee from it or die upon it. He said that the cross where Jesus died became also the cross where his apostles died. The loss, the rejection, the shame belong both to Christ and to all who in very nature are his. The cross that saves them also slays them. And anything short of that is his futile faith, not true faith at all. So it is by faith in Christ alone. It is by scripture alone. It is because of the cross, because of what he did for us alone. You know, I was reading about Thomas Hucker. Thomas Hucker was, actually he was a little bit before the Reformation. Thomas Hucker believed the scriptures to be his only word of faith. His only word, the only word of God. And he was condemned to be burned at the stake. But as he was being led to his place of burning, many of the faithful in the crowd followed, asked him, somehow give him a sign if the grace of God is sufficient to the fire. Imagine that. Give us a sign if the grace of God is sufficient in the fire. His prosecutors tied him to the stake, piled bundles of sticks around him, and set them on fire. For a while, Parker, uh, Hawker prayed aloud, but the violence of the flames soon took away his voice, and he stood silent in the flames, unmoving, even as his flesh turned black and his fingers burst into fire. He stood that way for so long that most thought he was dead. Then suddenly and unexpectedly, he stretched out his arms over his head towards the living God, his hands flaming like torches, and with an act of rejoicing that all could send, struck his hands together three times, as if for the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. You think that God's grace is sufficient in the fire? I believe, I believe it is. But are we willing to stand in the fire? Are we willing to stand for this truth? You know, on July 6, 1415, John Huss was also burned at the stake. A week before in his prison cell, he was praying. And the guard that was guarding him wrote down his prayer. And this is what he said. And this is kind of sum up this message, but this is what he said. He said, Lord, give me a fearless heart, a right faith, a firm hope, a perfect love, that for thy sake I may lay down my life with patience and joy. Imagine that. He didn't pray, open the gate so I can escape. He said, give me a fearless heart. Give me a right faith, a firm hope, a perfect love that, that for thy sake I may lay down my life with patience and joy. I wonder why we don't see Christians of this caliber anymore. I think something's gone wrong with our Christianity. 
I tell you what, I do see Mormons of this caliber. I see Jehovah Witnesses of this caliber. That they will die for their faith. I remember the person who led me to Christ. Or actually, uh, before that, I remember the person who led me to the Jehovah Witnesses. I was maybe seven, eight years old. And he lived maybe three, four houses down where I lived. And uh, he didn't have any kids, him and his wife. And he was a very good man. And he did Bible studies for kids as a Jehovah Witness. That's what he did. And he went to our, my home and he told my dad, hey, can, can he come to our Bible studies? And my dad wasn't a Christian or Catholic or nothing like that. So he didn't know any better. He said, yeah, he could go. So I started going to his home and he did the Bible studies with me. And then I uh, got a little older, became Jehovah Witness, baptized in the Jehovah Witness, and and then uh, started working for the organization. And he became an overseer. This is a person that's kind of like a district superintendent. And I became his helper. And then I started working for the headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. And but during that time, he could never had any kids. And when I was working in, at, the, at the headquarters, I heard that he was able, him and his wife were able to have a, a little girl. Well, he was a very dedicated Jehovah Witness. And he, maybe the girl at that time might have been three or four years old, maybe a little, little older, maybe five. She wasn't more than five at the time. But him and his wife and his little girl were going to speak at a different kingdom hall, different Jehovah Witness church in a different town. And they were in a really bad car accident. And they were all hurt, but the little daughter was badly hurt. One of her legs just came off of her body. And so she lost a lot of blood. And they were life flighted to a hospital. And the doctors t told him, she needs a blood transfusion. She lost too much blood. Well, I don't know if you know this, but Jehovah's Witnesses have a strong position that you cannot give or receive a blood transfusion. If you do, you will be excommunicated never to return to the, to the church. One of my other friends who was Joe Witness was there at the hospital with him. And they said he was pacing back and forth like a caged animal. What do I do? What do I do? Well, make a long story short, he denied her a blood transfusion. She died an hour later. But thinking back, what a, what a faith that man had. What a devotion to his church he had. That he loved his daughter so much, but... He thought what he was doing was right. What an amazing faith he had, devotion. But I think about that. What about me and what about you? We have the true faith. He let his daughter die for a false faith, a different gospel, a different Jesus, a different spirit. But we have the true faith. God has had mercy upon your life. He has saved you by faith. Are we as devoted, as dedicated as that person was for a lie? What about us for the truth? Something's gone wrong with our Christianity. You know, we, you look at all these Mormons, look at all these Jehovah Witnesses, very dedicated, they're out there. I'm not saying there's not people here that are not dedicated. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I say, as a church in general... You know, you look at all these different world religions. You look at the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims and the Sai Babas, all these different Krishnas, all these different... And these people are dedicated. They'll die before they deny their faith. When you see them, it's evident that they are whatever religion they are. I think we should be more dedicated than that. Don't you think? How many of you have been saved by faith through Christ alone? Look at what Jesus has done here. It is by faith alone. It is because of this great God that who came down to earth and died for us. It is because of the scriptures alone. It is because of faith alone. It is because of this cross alone. I think God wants us to have the same spirit as these reformers. These battle cries that we should keep dear, that we should hold dear, that we should hold on, that is through faith alone. Isn't it any wonder that 
these cults deny these three things, the cross alone, faith alone, scripture alone. No wonder they can't be saved. But we're here for a purpose. We're here to be able to share our faith with these groups that are lost. Would you stand with me? You know, I, I think God wants us to be more dedicated than we are to him. How many believe that? I don't think God is ever going to say to pastor, pastor, you just do too dedicated. You just do too much. I'm never going to hear that. You're just, you just do too much for Mormon, for Jehovah. No, I can do more. I must do more. You know, the time is coming that no one will be able to work. I think time is today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is that we must be able to share our faith. Church, I'd like to thank you for having me here. I appreciate everything you guys do. This church is tremendously, I've heard the story. Pastor, I appreciate your devotion, commitment. All the pastors here, I appreciate you guys having me here. I'll end with this. You know, Martin Luther, Martin Luther was a great German reformer. And Martin Luther used to, you know, he, he was interviewed right before he died. And he was asked a question. What was your great secret? How was it that you shook the, the Pope, the Cardinals, the churches in Europe? How was it that you shook with your Reformation? What was your great secret? He said this, I have no secret. I only live my life as if Christ died yesterday. As if Christ uh, resurrected today and as if coming tomorrow. Imagine that. I live my life as if Christ died yesterday, rose again from the dead today, and is coming tomorrow. How would you live your life if you believe that? Probably a lot different. Maybe we would love more, give more, do more. All these things we would do because Christ is coming. We should be ready. Thank you, church.